All right. We are in the wild. So, Bology, this has become a holiday tradition. Welcome back. We're going to do an annual recap of everything that happened in this ungodly year for crypto and, <laughs> and markets. Uh, and more importantly, we're going to take a look ahead. So, um, first off, uh, I think this is the this is the third time uh, that we've done this, and and uh, this is the fanciest background that you have. So clearly, the bear market did not impact you too much because the last couple of times, kind of like Guantanamo Bay in the background. Well, and then, all right, you've got this very fancy. It's pure virtual background. <laughs> That's a you know you know Mystique. Uh, you know that thing from X Men <laughs> where he's like. Show me the real you, perfection, yes. right? Okay. <laughs> so it's a it's a it's a whiteboard, and yeah. uh, you know I don't uh, I'm not I'm not like a, a physically spendy person, but this is a little go, brighter. Go, so go back, go, go back to the other one. It's bright. There we go. Know, we're now know, we're now warped into a, a nice yeah. kind of thing. I mean, go ahead. We're, yeah. we're we're all good. So, um, you know, I, I guess for starters, um, so we obviously just dropped our, our annual report. Um, the uh, the theses for the next year and uh, and it's equal parts uh, a look back and a look forward, but um, it's it's hard to look forward until we have a bottom, right? Um, and so I'm I'm curious uh, just to start out uh, with your take on what were the most damaging uh, things that happened in 2022? You know, basically what broke? Um, what silver linings are there, if any? Um, and then how do we find a bottom? So may, maybe, maybe let's start with like just ripping off the bandaid, like, you know, worst things that happened in 2022, like, let's just acknowledge that. And then that can kind of serve as a baseline for us to build from in terms of either what needs fixing, what new solutions are needed in the market. Um, you know, we've had this conversation a couple of times, chin up, the thesis is intact, right. Uh, kind of, you know, uh, pumping each, each, each other up, uh, even during some of the darkest days of like this fall. Um, but I'm curious just, just to hear you know, your view because um, you've been like me around for multiple market cycles. This one in some respects- A decade respects, now. We're now a decade. A We're now 10 decade, years in crypto. Which is we wild. can actually check that yeah. thing. 10 years of experience in yeah. cryptocurrencies. It's, 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 it's outrageous. Um, and that used to, you know, we used to make fun of people that said that because it would always mean that they were you know, in crypto since 2006. But, yeah, um, yeah, but here exactly. we are. Um, but I, I do think it's a helpful starting point because we have that kind of benefit of experience. But um, where, you know, what 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 is your take on the year in review, um, and, um, and and what the kind of key takeaways and lessons are uh, from uh, from this past year? So, you know, the uh, the thing is, it's never as bad as it seems, and it's never, or I shouldn't say never, it's rarely as bad as it seems, and it's rarely as good as it seems. You know, that's something you tell entrepreneurs, you tell founders to sort of discount their emotions on the up and down swings or whatever. And, you know, the thing is that I, at least personally, I've never been a trader, you know, like I've never been like a check the price daily, you know, look for the Bollinger bands or whatever, you know, that's just never been my thing, um, mainly because it's it's like it's so unpredictable. And instead, I've always just been a buy long kind of person. So, you know, I, it's, it's something where um, if, I, if our thesis remains unchanged in some ways, and uh, what's the thesis is that basically, if you want to have root over your finances, your identity, all those <clears throat> things online, um, you're going to need crypto. Otherwise, it's going to be de facto controlled by the U.S. establishment or the Chinese establishment. That's like the thesis on crypto. Are you going to actually be sovereign over your own digital possessions or are you effectively going to be, you know, a, uh, a powerless surf, right? A digital surf. That part remains unchanged. Now, in the specifics, what, what obviously like lots of projects blew up this year. Luna blew up. Uh, 3AC blew up. Um, obviously, FTX blew up. Uh, and then a bunch of other like lending things like, you know, uh, was it Voyager, BlockFi, uh, Celsius. Uh, I, the thing is, this is a type of stuff that I basically don't touch. Just meaning, it's just not that interesting to me. Like I'm, I'm like a freedom kind of person. I mean, there's, I'm sure, like you know, there's, it's good to have lenders and stuff out there. But the entire thing of leverage trading and so on, where you can lose more than you put in, I just, it's never been my kind of thing, right? So that's why I, I kind of look at this stuff and I'm like, well, that's that's bad. But then we kind of keep going. Now, with that said, I would say there was one thing that was different this year than previous years. And what that is, 
is that um, some of the frauds or some of the like bad projects had looked like, uh, or, or rather, they were not obviously bad projects, right? In previous years, it was pretty obvious. Anybody in the space could see BitConnect or whatever. I mean, anybody could see it. something like that. It's like obviously bad, right? But something like FTX, for example, was a very sophisticated fraud that you know took a lot of people unawares, and uh, and including crucially the um, federal re regulators themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And one thing that I think a lot about as an important goal for us, you know, in, in you know the the years to come, is we need to think about it uh, sort of like spam detection. You don't mark every email as spam, and you don't mark no emails as spam. If you if you mark every email as spam, you don't have anything in your inbox. If you mark no emails as spam, then spam floods your inbox. So both false uh, positives and false negatives are are injurious. You want to have a, you know a balance of the two, okay? And that's a concept of regulation as a binary classifier. And so just like you don't want to mark every email as spam, you don't want to mark every project as scam. You want to be able to uh, not you know if you mark every project as scam or you mark no projects as scam, those are both bad in the same way that marking you know everything is spam or nothing is spam is bad. So starting to think about regulation as a binary classifier is kind of metal detector, which you can wand over a project and have go like this when when the project is bad, but also crucially benchmark it so it's not giving false alarms on good projects. That's actually something which is a effectively a mathematical problem. It's a it's a reputational problem. It's like credit scores or what have you. We haven't built that yet as an industry. It's not functional yet. Um, and uh, you know maybe there's no signal that could have pulled out you know FTX or Luna or whatever. But I actually don't think we've tried. Um, and you know maybe it's something like what is expert anonymous opinion? You know like here's a hundred people in crypto. What is what are their takes on this? Uh, or uh, what does on-chain accounting say? Um, like that to say, what's their proof of reserve say? And more generally, their proof of reserves and liabilities. And more generally still, their, their on-chain accounting. So take all the signals and aggregate them and try to actually say, this is actually a fraud, this is not a fraud, and so on, and be sensitive and specific about it. Anyway, so that's a problem. That's what I think is the solution. Let me pause there. Yeah, I, I, I think in 2017, it was all about the biggest ideas, right? It was like everything can be tokenized and so there should be an ICO for it like you know just indiscriminately there will be its uh, tokens are going to eat the world they're going to eat software they're going to where they're going to eat the fault you know everything will have some type of embedded token incentive and so let's invest behind these ideas these white papers because you know they're going to conquer the universe just like Ethereum did um, and I think that was misguided and, and most everything went to zero um, I feel like this time around we had a few applications that found product market market fit right um, and, and or, uh, it sounded like you were going to interject there. So let me say, yeah, I was going to interject uh, for a second. Er, well, early equals wrong. Right. So, um, e even, even in the case that like, maybe that is the 10 year, 15, 20 year plan. Like that was, that was, that was way, way, you know, decade or multi-decade, maybe, maybe ahead of the curve that, that thinking, um, and this cycle, it felt more like you had a, a, a set of innovations and zero to one. And then a whole class around them basically rallied off of the narrative around that. And and so you know you know maybe this cycle where the true fundamentals on a per project basis matter, right? To your point, where you're looking at the proof of reserves and the balance sheet, or you're looking at like the on-chain accounting and the and the you know, metrics associated. Um, so we're kind of gradually getting into a more fundamentals-driven era. Do you think that's a fair way to way to look at this, or would you justify it differently? Well, so first is, I would say, um, if you look at Carlota Perez or the Gartner hype cycle, um, basically almost every technology has had this you know, speculative bubble that comes up and it gets a lot of attention and investment in the space and the crash, and then it's got to rise. This is just like the way that humans install technology. You can go back to railroads, you can go back obviously to the dot-com bubble and so on. And uh, you're right that too early is the same as being wrong. But it's also true that lots of stuff that was put out there during the dot-com bubble, for example, the QCAT, which was like scanning barcodes mm -hmm. that became, you know, QR codes or, um, you know, a web van that became Instacart or, um, you know, every, everything you can think of that people tried their flus was actually a digital currency. Okay. Everything that people tried was too early and you needed, you know, the iPhone and you needed all of this other stuff. But if you think of that entire thing as that all of that expense in the 90s, the entire dot-com crash as a search for Google and Amazon, 
and also maybe a subsidy of what became Facebook and you know a subsidy of the internet technologies that have enabled the new Microsoft app. That paid for itself, right? In a sense, like you know, similarly, like chatbots. Okay, five years ago, six years ago, that was obviously you know Silicon Valley being stupid and hyped up or whatever. I think 2015, 2016, ton of hype about chatbots, right? People laughed. Oh, there's just if statements. You know, you know. And I remember actually, I have like an old diary that I wrote to myself. I'm like, you know, solving chatbots in full generality is essentially improving on Google because it's iterative search. Right? You mm -hmm. type in free text, you get back a response, you need to get something like that's literally beating Google at its own game. So I'm like, I think that's possible, potentially, we need to have breakthroughs in like, you know, large language models, which is now obvious today, but basically, you know, the way I was talking about it at the time, or thinking about it at the time, just natural language processing, and you need to have, be able to have integrate information over a long distance, which actually was developed, so-called transformer and stuff in AI. Point being that that thing that was a joke five or six years ago, got enough hype that it pulled people in. And, uh, you know, like Greg Brockman of OpenAI has actually written about how chatbots were, maybe not the 2016 bubble, but previous, you know, the concept of Eliza and other chatbots is what got him into this space. So basically this entire thing, in a sense, like the 2013 bubble got Vitalik into doing Ethereum or whatever, right? Or maybe there's a 2011 mm -hmm. bubble that did that. <laughs> so in a sense, that whole thing is like a giant content marketing cost that pulls in, you know, the Larry Page or the Mark Zuckerberg or what have you that then pays for itself, right? That's like, it's a flip way of talking about it. But I think it's also probably true depending on, you know, each bubble and how you net it out. And actually, I think it was you who posted something a while back that was like a lot of the coins or things that were started in 2017, not a lot of them, but a fair number of them have actually become decent projects now. Like BNB was started in the year 2017 and we'll see what happens with Binance. But I, I, my sister, I obviously can't vouch for their financials or anything. Everybody's, you know, like, you know, looking under um, the covers of everything. But if if I have to bet, and I won't say it's a super high confidence bet, but I'd bet that Binance, if they have a problem, it'll be a problem with government criminals, not mm -hmm. criminal criminals. <laughs> and not, you know, right? It was a different kind Getting of thing. Getting shaken, right? shaken down. <laughs> yeah, like, like, you know, basically the kind of thing that happened to BitMEX where they'll go after them on some compliance issues or what have you, and then they'll figure out if they can do a settlement or, or something like that, right? That'd be my bet. But BNB, like Binance is still, it's a, it's a useful product that a lot of people have used, right? Okay. So without giving a super strong endorsement, just saying BNB was started then, ENS got started then, CryptoKitties and ERC721 and what became NFTs, even with them coming down, clearly has become a really big deal. And whether, it's not going to be the art NFTs necessarily that change things, it's you know the badges and so on. Um, obviously, the concept of issuing a token. A lot of things that were started then have actually shown some staying power, even if they go up 100x and get marked down 90% and it seems like, oh, everything is gone. We're just at a new equilibrium. We've got like 300 million people worldwide who hold some cryptocurrency. Um, and that's like just Coinbase plus Binance alone gets you there basically. And, uh, that's, that's rough, but those are, you know, some of the numbers I've seen. So mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't think of it as a failure. I just think of it as, you know, it's I two steps forward, one step back, I think actually understates it. I think it's like 10 steps forward and like three steps back or four steps back. If you actually looked at it numerically for things other than price, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, I, go I, well, I was saying something, I guess, slightly different, which is how investors will look at the space, right? I'm not, I'm not arguing that it hasn't been a, a net positive, data, positive dApps, right? Uh, I, and, and frankly, I think this might be the healthiest way for the ecosystem system to get built out in rapid, uh, you know, uh, very you know, rapid iterations because you need these bull phases to pull people in, but then you also need the busts to wash out the tourists, tourists, the uh, fraudsters, and the overlevered, and you know, the, the the people that don't actually share the same same long term values, and, and that are are sure. not going to build the strongest foundations. Um, so that like you know, bear markets are for builders. Meme, there's a kernel of truth there because th that builder class is re is responsible for building the next one, right? Um, yeah. that's, that's not to say that, you know, the, the hype cycles aren't, you know, valuable in their own right. I, what I was referencing was, um, going back to your, your scam, uh, versus spam, like email comparison, mm -hmm. ICO white papers, everything rallies on a meme because one, one application works Two, does everything get valued fairly and on an, you know, uh, uh, idiosyncratic basis, every single individual project based on its own merits in the next cycle, are we going to see more you know, discrimination when it comes to the, 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 the uh, part of investors as 
um, we hit the slope of enlightenment in the next phase. And people will be a little bit more rational, uh, rational and, and kind of discerning about which projects they're investing in or integrating with based on the true fundamentals versus just the narratives around them. Yeah. So, but first is like you, your audio has some, it's like kind of chopping in and out or something. Okay, um, okay. So not sure what can be done there. If something, maybe, maybe switch microphones or what have you. Yeah, um, second mic. Okay. So that's it. Uh, so on to your point. Um, I think that, uh, you know, so bear marks are for builders. Yes. Because you have to have like a meaning to stay in the game. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's something where if you're only there for the money and the money isn't there, you're not going to stay there. The same as I mentioned this in like the network state book, but the, the Puritans stayed during the harsh winters when other people who were there for just the money left, because there's something more than money. Um, do I think that that weeding is good? You want to repeat your question actually? Cause it, the audio was like only like, I got like maybe half it. Uh, so the, the question was, do, do we think that there's going to be more uh, fundamental driven investment or people are going to be a little bit more discerning on a per project basis in this is in this than they were yeah. this previous cycle where everything kind of rallies together? Because we've seen this you know, multiple cycles in a row. Is, is this kind of the last, last time that we have a big hype cycle where people just indiscriminately throw money at all these assets? Or will you start to see people kind of pick and choose because there are more fundamentals and there are more priors that people can build off of? So I don't know because I'm not sure that the pattern of a cycle and a bubble and a, you know thing, I'm not sure that will continue. Here's why. Obviously, we don't know what the Fed is going to do. Um, crypto is not in a vacuum. The um, uh, what's you know what's been happening with the printing, uh, you know, we'll see if there's another giant print in 2024. If so, then you know prices may go through the moon in 2025 and we may actually enter that maximalist, uh, you know, era of just Bitcoin going to a million dollars, right? But um, who knows what a million dollars buys? Um, will people be more discerning? I mean, I feel like memories are kind of short in a weird way, you know, like, I mean, now over 20 years, okay, there's been the 2001.com bubble. Then in the 2000s, by the way, there's this actually, you can Google this, uh, this video called Here Comes Another Bubble. It's in the mid 2000s, <laughs> it put out at Stanford. And what happened was it was after MySpace was acquired for like 580 million. I think it was around that time and Google had gone public and everybody thought that was another tech bubble because they'd all been scarred by the last bubble. So lots of people were very conservative and, you know, frankly, tech wasn't really even thought of as a real thing as part of the cultural conversation until I would say 2013. I think it took about 12 because basically during the 2000s, it was all about Iraq and, you know, war on terror and so on and so forth. And the iPhone and stuff only rose after 2008 and the combination of mobile and social and, you know, like 4G LTE everywhere, all that type of stuff. The entire modern Internet era is only about 10 years old, really from 2013. OK, mm -hmm. and and it all just kind of snapped together. And basically, I remember over this period, people called like 10 of the last one bubbles. OK, basically during the 2000s and during the 2010s, it was bubble, 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 tech is in a bubble, et cetera. Sam Altman had a famous bet on this. Not, not that famous, but like it was, a, it was a bet on like whether it was a bubble or not. He was very close, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, he basically his predictions on valuations were pretty good. With that said, the Fed did blow up a bubble, but it wasn't a bubble in tech per se. It was a bubble in the entire economy after after 08. So. I guess I. I my, my answer there is I don't know because A, it depends on whether the Fed is printing more. B, if the Fed is printing more, we're going to have other really interesting things. I think they'll probably be forced to because jacking up interest rates to the Paul Volcker level of like 20% or more to beat inflation will break a lot of things and cause a lot of pain. And people are going to want to you know have that assuage. Do you see what California did on this? No. California is a good precedent, right? They uh, recently printed money to help people with their bills. Uh, okay. Now, okay. Um, here, hold on. It's, uh, it's basically, um, where is it? Yeah, uh, 1,050 of inflation relief. Okay. Now, um, here, let me see if I can post that. Uh, it's like, in, can I post anywhere here? 
I'm not sure if I can post, but if you- It's just, just in our private chat. It's in our private chat, but if you send it to our private chat, maybe uh, maybe Dougie can-, uh, can Yeah, see if you can put it on yep. the screen, okay? So um, so that shows like, you know, California's giving residents up to 1,050 of inflation relief. That's a good precedent where San Francisco, California style, you know, like banana republic governance then gets exported to Seattle and to LA and to lots of other places, right? And so obviously, if this is applied at the federal level, it's very tempting to do that. Oh, my bills are, you know, high. I understand that. And then print money. Okay, uh, well, you've just made the problem worse, um, especially if it's widely distributed, which will, there'll be calls to do that, right? So um, this is a good, I think, precedent for mm -hmm. what could come. And then you can also see this, which is, um, you know, uh, you can maybe paste that, put that one up there. Warren is calling for, um, we'll see if that actually works, but uh, calling for rate hikes to stop and, and so on, right? So there's going to be, I think, building pressure. Oh, and one other thing. Remember the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? Yes, which is depleted yeah, so, by about 50% now. Yeah, that's right. So, so in order to win in the <clears throat> you know, 2022 election cycle, um, the you know, that was, that was tapped, right? Like a few weeks before the election, probably almost certainly, uh, you know, uh, here, just paste this one in. I mean, does that help in the, you know, final stretch of the election? Probably. So should we expect <coughs> some huge airdrop in October, 2024? I think that might be the October surprise. It's quite possible. Especially you know, if there's hey. a CBTC. Yeah, I, well, so I actually don't think America is going to. So I don't I think, think so either. We'll, we'll get into that, but we'll get into that just to, on a very short. You know, I, I mentioned this a while back. You know, the Fed had said something about a CBDC and they'd hired McKinsey to study the problem or something like that. That's just, that's never going to ship ever. The American dollar, uh, like digital dollar, will be um, like a blessed version of USDC or something like that. Um, that say it's going to be a private stable coin that then gets fully blessed and brought into the system. And uh, because obviously that's out there, that's shipping, that's being used, there's programmatic hooks on it and the government can't ship anything, but it can regulate things. And that's different than, you know, the Chinese state, which is actually doing a first class, you know, like full CBDC. So that's like in China, it's gonna be state driven. In America, it'll be corporation driven. And then perhaps in the rest of the world, it'll be like network driven, okay? Um, so I don't, so, so maybe it's, USDC airdrop in, in October, 2024, that's possible, right? Um, you know, who knows? Or, or, just, or just in your normal bank account, right? Point is that I think is the upstream driver of whether there's a cycle or not. Mm -hmm. um, that, and also the other thing that's on a four year cycle, which is the halving. The halving didn't seem to push Bitcoin prices that high this time. So we'll see what happens. Um, and then on top of that, there's obviously other things that are happening in tech. There's, you know, there's obviously AI, uh, which is now really working. Um, there is, uh, there's India that's rising. There's, you know, the Saudis and like, you know, Middle East, actually, they're making tons of money from, you know, these high energy prices. So, so it's, you know, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm not sure that it'll, the whole world will be rising and falling in sync or that the bubble, the, the kinds of things we saw in the 2010s that were calibrate on. Maybe they maybe they keep rates high for a really long time. Maybe it's just like some extreme breakage of the system in 2025 where things break in weird ways. I don't know. What I do know is we can bet on secular trends, which are digital sovereignty and you know other kinds of things in other areas like you know CRISPR and, and things. Well, uh, we'll get into some of those decentralized solutions, but let's just wrap on the um, on the risks to some of the centralized entities. Um, you know, Coinbase has. Yep. Uh, I think, you know, 10, you know, 10, 20 of the total crypto market cap under custody. Uh, Binance has a 75% market share right now on, on global trading volumes by some, by some accounts. Um, um, there are some centralization risks within crypto right now uh, that I think need to be addressed. Uh, uh, and and you know, perhaps the biggest risk, as you pointed out, is in the, the legal and, and, and regulatory realm. Um, what do you think are the short-term solutions to reducing that risk uh, in 2023? Because if we can eliminate that risk uh, as like an existential one right now, that there's too much centralization at the big exchanges or there's too much concentration of market market power from these, you know, uh, uh, maybe state sanctional actors, then, then, um, then I think 
you know, we can start to form a bottom and then you can give people the stability that they need to, to build for the, the slope of enlightenment, right? Whether it's a, yeah. it's a cycle or whether it's just the long slog back to, you know, uh, case by case credibility. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we mentioned other things that started working in 2017, 2018. DEXs are a huge thing that's been working over the last four years. They work. That's a big, that's a, kind of the penny that hasn't dropped. For the most part, DeFi has stood up. It's mostly mm -hmm. been the centralized entities that have had problems, right? Because they can hide the ball to a greater extent. They're not, it's not, you know, DeFi protocols are getting a work at every single day. And so, it's, you know, I'm not saying they're completely invulnerable, but they're getting a work at. And uh, so now that we have DEXs and now that we have, you know, like I think an improved decentralized stack, I mean, maybe it's time to just start phasing out centralized custody and just going to decentralized custody for everything, right? I think, um, you know, I'd love to see large exchanges figure out a model where it is as or more profitable for them to have all funds decentralized than centralized. That you basically add up the possibility of hacks or seizures or, you know, just issues with centralized custody, liability, whatever. And you say, look, I'd actually prefer it for a variety of reasons if you held it on your uh, computer, right? And, or, or, you know, you could keep it on your phone as well, right? Um, though, you know, I actually do think that for moderately large amounts of money, people want to keep it on their computer rather than their phone, but whatever, right? Either is fine. There's different ways of doing it. It's harder wallets, other stuff, of course. Um, and I, I would love to see that where basically, um, you know, the concept of going to a centralized exchange, actually, one way of thinking about it in the, in the mid 2000s, you know, Facebook, if I, if I recall this correctly, had you type in your Gmail password into Facebook? I don't remember that. Yeah. And it would invite yeah. people. It was before OAuth was a, uh -huh. was a yep. thing. Yeah. Okay. And in theory, they could basically just log in as you or what have you. If I remember correctly, before OAuth was a thing, that was that very insecure, you know, method of handling credentials and it wasn't scoped or anything like that. You just basically trusted Facebook to hit reply all or, or scrape your contacts. And that was when it was like a novelty to hit invite all, invite all your friends or whatever. Um, and then OAuth got developed and then that got completely deprecated. And there's other things like that where HTTP connections to websites, you know, Telnet was an old, but well, this goes even further back. Telnet was like a protocol for insecure communication between computers and it was replaced with SSH. And so, uh, so maybe that's what it is. Maybe just like FTX, if there's a silver lining in that dark cloud, it's that $8 billion was lost, but it's not $800 billion in a few years where the state seizes all the assets that are on an exchange. You know, yep. and if you if you believe sites like Glassnode, assets are coming off exchanges. And you know what's funny about that? I actually think DeFi is driving a fair amount of that. Um, yep. I don't know because people want to use DeFi protocols and they can't always do that on exchange. And so they need to have it off exchange. And so for the user, it has started to become more profitable. And so that profit compensates for the hassle of holding funds locally. And that may make all the difference. Right. Once you've got incentive land. 100 percent. And I, I think that's one of the trends we think is going to uh, uh, is going to we actually have two uh, uh, related charts. Well, different charts, but kind of kind of touching on the same point that, that I think you're making. One um, that's, I think, fascinating is you can essentially look at the on chain wow. volumes um, of, uh, of Uniswap versus Coinbase. And um, and I think it'll be an interesting, an interesting parlor game to see how close the crypto community to predicting Coinbase earnings from here on out, because you basically just have to add 20, 30 percent to Uniswap volumes. And that should be Coinbase's target transaction volume uh, and, and trading volume for the quarter. Um, but it's been it's been it's been really consistent uh, this year. And, and in fact, Uniswap has been has been catching up a bit. Uh, this one actually uh, scrolled up a little bit, Dougie. Um, on Filecoin that I think is, is interesting to your point on people actually leveraging these de decentralized protocols. Um, we've had, I think, a supply, supply glut in um, some of the decentralized uh, protocols that, you know, the, the proverbial solutions looking for problems. You're not gonna, really going to be able to see it here for those that are, are watching. But if you uh, if you zoom in on this chart or you go to the Filecoin quarterlies that we have, the most interesting part, interesting part actually in the in the bottom uh, half of, of this graphic, which shows the quarterly growth, growth in storage deals, in uh, network capacity, and then in utilization too. And that last one is the most important because that right. is up 5x so far this year. Yep. And 
in spite of all the headwinds that we've seen in the sheer prices, there are pockets that are growing within crypto in terms of usage and the growth is a hockey stick. So whether you're talking about yeah. decentralized networks, whether you're talking about DEX, um, it's been uh, it's been remarkably consistent that that has slowly started to to you know, take over as a, a predominant narrative versus the central centralized alternatives. And, and you know the funny thing is, if you graph like valuation <laughs> divided by utilization, you'd probably see I don't know a hundred x a year ago or something mm -hmm. like that, a thousand x, and now it's maybe an hour to just a ten x difference or whatever, something like that, right? So because utilization is up and price is down. And so th that's just the nature of like the the bubble magicking these into existence that then grow some of them, you know. So that's interesting. Um, the other thing that's like this, as you know, is cryptofees.info. Yep. I can that as well if you want to bring that up. Um, um, uh, lots, lots of sources that we could turn to, but I want to I want to um, keep moving on um, because I think sure. we just scratched the surface here. So um, yep. the other thing that I uh, I think you know, we should talk about, um, and I think you were the first person person to bring on to this concept last year. The the layer zero, the moral layer, as you called it, yeah, right, right, um, the why of crypto, and I do feel like we got away from that a little bit this year. This year, um, what is you know, what, what is your uh, advice or, or kind of what's your rallying cry cry for, for folks that are, are feeling, you know, forlorn? And I'm asking because I've heard it um, when I said that I, a mean, couple, I said that a couple tweets in November and December, like, you know, essentially, fuck this shit, man. I'm, 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 did I really waste a decade here? And Bology is the first person that texts or calls like, hey, man, you got to talk. Here's what's happening. <laughs> like, he's got like a game plan. plan. So what's your, what's yeah. your talk for a broader community? Well, I mean, you know, I've I've written some articles on this, uh, and I think um, <clears throat> so. If you read this article I wrote called "Bitcoin is Civilization," let me actually paste these in. Um, this is the original network state. Uh, well, this is it's not the original network state one. It's basically there's uh, you think about Bitcoin is a flag of technology. Uh, yeah, 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 uh, flag of technology. That's right. Yeah. Right. So this is this is um, here's just a few. Basically, a lot of people are thinking about geopolitics now, but geopolitics and network politics are going to converge and uh, really already have, but just hasn't been thought of as such. And if you kind of read like those two articles, right, Bitcoin and civilization, and then, you know, the, uh, that's like the domestic case, like within the US. And then uh, the next one is the foreign policy um, uh, dot com article. That's the uh, mm -hmm. next link. Yeah, great protocol politics. That's, that gives kind of a global case. And then you can read the networkstate.com uh, if you put that on screen. That's a book length case, okay. Um, so I put that out in July. And um, a lot of what the network state talks about is how you know technology is a tool for freedom and how you can build communities that are about something more than money with these tools that were built for money, right? And that's only a V1 on my personal scale. Like I think of it as very much a minimum viable product. I want to get it out there and just get feedback. And I'm, you're working on a, a hopefully much improved V2 with a lot of bells and whistles and uh, working on actually building some of the first, maybe building the first network state and also funding and, and helping building others. And I think that a lot of that comes together over the next few years. Um, and it's just, it's just different than what the last thing was about. You know, I mean, one way of thinking about it is in 2013, um, you know, the question was, was Bitcoin even legal? Right. And, uh, you know, there was that whole hearing at the end uh, of the year, if you remember that, with actually Jerry Brito uh, testifying at the Senate and, and so on. And uh, then 2017 is ICO bubble. And the question was, can we build dApps at all? Right. Will any dApps work? Now they work. I mean, Uniswap works, right? ENS works. These are like serious, robust apps that have taken a beating over years, right? You don't have to have like a huge number of them, but, you know, MetaMask, I mean, that's, is that a dApp? It's like quasi, right? You know, it's, it's certainly the code is running on people's local computers. It's, it's not all on chain state, but um, you have a bunch of these things and, um, and that's huge progress, right? And now the question is, can we knit them together to do something that is more than just trading and finance? One visual I have, did I tell you my reverse whirlwind visual? No, okay. Have you seen like a, you know, from the movies, like a tornado is tearing through, you know, Main Street in like Oklahoma and all the buildings whirl up into the air, right? Okay. 
one way I think about crypto is like a reverse tornado where it like starts with the Federal Reserve and then it's, you know, Wall Street and DeFi, right? So but let's say it's first it's gold, a replacement for the Federal Reserve, then DeFi was a replacement for Wall Street. And then it's like this reverse tornado in the very last frame of the movie, it goes voop like this and Main Street just builds out like that, right? Yep. Why, do, why do I say that? It's because essentially there's this enormous amount of money and financial infrastructure being built over here, this truly global financial infrastructure. And then when it's like ready to connect, you hit enter and just, you know, the lightning comes down from the cloud psh, like this and you just materialize buildings in the physical world. Because if you can move $100 million around the world, you can have thousands of homes spring up in any place that allows for quick build, which is not California, but lots of places around the world do. You can use prefab, you can use modular housing. Have you seen the videos that I've posted where like uh, the Chinese are building like subway stations in like nine hours yeah, and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Right? Yep. yeah. So lots of places in the world where a hundred million dollars will build a lot of stuff. You could build like a burning man kind of thing in a day, right? And uh, and so the last frame of the movie, we'll just see poof, like this, where all this infrastructure actually causes things to happen, okay? And, um, and, you know, that, that money is not simply used for speculating on other money, but it's actually directed at something. And that's actually why I'm very much into these crypto communities, because you've got things like Kift, which is van life or cul-de-sac, which is um, a, you know, si startup city in Arizona or Praxis or things like that. Not all of them call themselves crypto communities, but they're all startup cities or startup societies of some kind. And now you've got a financial system that can support any kind of society worldwide. They could be in South America, like Prospera. They could be in Arizona. They could be in like Korea, like Busan, um, you know, for this, uh, this project called Oceanics and so on and so forth. So that's what I think kind of comes next. And it doesn't just look like more DeFi, nothing wrong with DeFi, whatever, that's fine. But DeFi is neutral. It's a tool. What is that tool used for? I think that tool is going to be used for political and geopolitical innovation. Uh, uh, go uh, let's get into some of those uh, kind of category by category. Um, there's five sections in the annual report. I know there's a, a couple of, of top themes that you want to cover for the new year. Sure. Uh, we break it down into, into, into which include Bitcoin and stable coins, uh, as well as some of the other you know, meme cryptocurrencies, um, Ethereum and, and other layer ones, DeFi, NFTs and decentralized social, uh, which I know we'll talk a bit about, a bit about DAOs and, and decentralized hardware networks or networks or, or what we call decentralized physical infrastructure. Um, you know, it. I, I think out of everything that we've uh, just flirted with and, and talked about, Bitcoin about Bitcoin seems to be left out. Left out. Uh, if the Ethereum merge, it's almost like people have forgotten about Bitcoin again, uh, and and all of the hype and all of the narrative kind of going into next year. Uh, it seems like it's around, like it's around, you know, Ethereum flipping Bitcoin or, um, you know, the, uh, the, the regulators in, in Europe and the U.S. souring on it because of its energy usage and kind of the odd man out on the proof of work side. How, how do you think about um, the three types of crypto money, if you will, right? So these U.S. dollar nominated stable coins, Bitcoin, and then Ethereum as kind of an up and comer. I think, I mean, I think uh, it's a big world. I think they're all going to be successful in different ways. Um, uh, you know, I remain a large Bitcoin proponent. I'm also a big Ethereum proponent. Um, I'm a dollar user. I'm not sure I call it a proponent. Um, with respect to Bitcoin, um, I think it is, uh, my view on it is, uh, you know, it's, it's now something which is absolutely world famous. Everybody knows about it. It's like email. It's a protocol that billions and billions of people have heard of multiple times. It's affected every single bank and government in the world. And people who are new to the space will say things like, what kind of Bitcoin should I buy? Right? Which sounds silly, but it's also like, you know what the generic term for soda is in the South? Coke. Coke. Right. Exactly. So the brand name becomes like a generic name. So what kind of Bitcoin should I buy? And uh, the thing is that you can argue perhaps Bitcoin doesn't have that much technological innovation recently. People who are into lightning or things will argue against it. But let's say you take that. Right. The thing is that the Bitcoin community, I would argue, is actually more focused on political innovation, like flipping governments, mm -hmm. you know, like El Salvador or having mayors, you know, uh, receive their salary in Bitcoin. Ethereum is actually also doing this with, you know, Wyoming having uh, its Dow law, right? Colorado has its new like cooperatives thing. Um, I'm hearing that Tennessee has now got a Dow law and so on. These are, these are really good signs, by the way. Um, that's the kind of thing where you can now have those, just like 
there's a cryptocurrency fiat currency bridge, like the cloud and land bridge. There's now a crypto company fiat company bridge between DAOs and like off chain, um, you know, or offline legal entities. Yeah. And what I think that what Bitcoin is doing though is more generally political activism, enabling that kind of stuff. Though of course they, uh, you know, many people in the community hate everything other than Bitcoin. I I don't you know I don't discount Bitcoin at all because. In the event of an actual collapse of the dollar, like a collapse like what happened with Venezuela, and you know, as inflation rises and as, as instability rises, that that probability is less remote than it was 10 years ago. You might still say that it could be averted, but seeing that thing I just pasted with California, you know, giving a thousand dollars for inflation relief, which is out of an Ayn Rand novel or something. Okay, that's like really they're printing ten thousand dollars to get you out of your you know your inflation relief, right? Um, if and when that happens, people will want very simple things that they can rely on. I mean, if you think FTX and $8 billion from a high risk cryptocurrency account vanishing was bad, and of course it was. I mean, if one day, God forbid, people wake up and their bank accounts, their US dollar bank accounts are frozen, or you know, inflation is not eight or 9%, but 50%, like it has been in other countries, many other countries within our lifetimes, that's Venezuela, that's Argentina, in Cyprus in 2013. Remember the bail-ins in Cyprus, the haircuts mm -hmm. for bank yep. holders, right? All the people who had the misfortune, just like FTX, except it was now something that was ordered by the state, where the haircut was something like, uh, you know, quasi-decapitation. I think like 50% of their funds were taken to pay for you know, the bank's own profligacy, right? Fractional Reserve sets up a system that that will eventually unwind like that. Who knows what it, whether it happens in our lifetime. So in such a time... It's like, you know, you're clinging to a life raft, right? People want something that's really certain, a simple explanation, because if the state fails, what is there, right? And that's so enormous that it's like, uh, it's just not something that most people can handle. And I want to try to see if we can have parallel civilizations basically booted up in the eventuality that's, that happens. Of course, there's existing, so there's India, there's, um, there's other countries besides just the US and China. But uh, but we're not fully there yet as something which can can catch the rain. <clears throat> and like Bitcoin is a thing that is mature and that you can at least surf that one thing. I don't think money is the only thing that matters. I think you're going to want public goods and all these other things. You want to rebuild civilization on their side. But as that apocalypse insurance, and by the way, if, you know, it's funny. People are like, haha, you know, that sound, you sound like a prepper or something like didn't people just spend all this time in lockdown in 2020? <laughs> is it like th three years? China just got out of lockdown, right? All of this kind of dystopian stuff. Unfortunately, we've seen previews of lots of it, right? We've seen riots, we've seen fires, we've seen shootings, we've seen political confrontations, we've seen, you know, people deplatformed and silenced and unbanked. We've seen inflation. We've seen like, unfortunately, a preview of a lot of the movie. And in 2008, you know, 2008 was like a preview for 2020, where the printing of 2008 that was so aberrant became the de rigueur policy of 2020, right? So maybe the lockdowns are things, now that the state knows it can do that, if there's another form of civil unrest, do they the lockdown again? Who the heck knows? Are there inflation lockdowns? Hey, you have to stay in your home because gas prices are too high and you know th that's what you have to do. Who knows, right? Basically the point is, that's why I'm not betting against Bitcoin. Bitcoin is unfortunately the long short of the existing system. And then well, maybe well, the bedrock that builds up the new one. Yeah, well, it, it, it is that. And then there's also a slightly less dystopian middle ground, which looking at this sure. year and what happened with Russia, right? You now have, yeah. have two of uh, the, the, the global order that are, are realigning in terms of where they think about reserve currencies. Um, and after you know, the US uh, and, and the West sanctions of, of Russia, and Russia and basically of, of US treasury, treasuries, um, more countries than ever that are, that are starting to rate to, you know, quote unquote, outside money or, or hard commodity based money instead of, of uh, US or, or, or euros. So, so even if that, if that doesn't lead to, you know, short term, short term hyperinflation, some of the disaster scenarios you, you, you outline, that just seems like a natural rotation that some of these other countries are going to uh, uh, make offense, maybe even, even because they're not sure if they're on our naughty list or not, right? Um, and Ethereum is maybe, is maybe too technically complex or too much of an everything project versus Bitcoin, which is the very single purpose focused um, global hedge, I guess. Um, that, uh, There's a that, place for both. That, 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 ah. it, it, I'm not trying to pair them against each yeah. other, but I'm, right. I'm talking about who has the greater narrative 
uh, when you're talking about, about potential living as this you know, alternative new reserve asset that, that might complement something like physical gold, gold. Yeah. I mean, like basically you're, you know, every, <laughs> probably every person, every institution will want to have some digital gold if, you know, the blockchain can actually manage that volume. But, um, you know, the thing about Ethereum is uh, it's, it's, I mean, you're going to need other financial assets besides just gold. I mean, mm -hmm. that part, there's some maximalists who don't get this. But I mean, why, when you start a new company, I mentioned this before, but when you start a new company, why do people issue stock? Why don't they just give dollars to everybody? Well, because in theory, that stock is, you know, one share gives you a piece of the discounted, uh, you know, future cash flows, right? Like, you know, you build a business and it throws off cash 10 years from now, and that stock entitles you to dividends. And so you can value it based on how much you think this business will rise. And moreover, if you're a shareholder during that rise up, you might close a deal for $10 million and that comes into the company and then you could dividend yourself out X dollars, right? So your efforts lead to results. And there's a correlation between your efforts and the stock price in theory, right? Whereas with the dollar, it's such a giant ocean that even a small or huge effort by you would only cause a small effect in the dollar. If anything, it probably wouldn't be noticeable. It's just a drop in the bucket, right? So the point being, that's like why equity exists. That's why we issue assets other than dollars. And uh, then by extension, you come up with many other kinds of assets. And so, of course, you're going to need things besides just gold. It's a necessary but not sufficient, um, you know, condition of the future world. And so you're going to have Bitcoin, you're going to have Ethereum. That's like, that's like very obvious to me, not maybe obvious to everybody. But I also actually think you're going to have, you know, other chains and other things as well. And, uh, you know, Ethereum wasn't as proven, by the way, in 2017 as it is in 2022. There is a like Lindy effect on everything, you know, mm -hmm. Ethereum, people didn't know if it was going to get hacked or whatever. It was under a lot of pressure in 2017. Now, especially post merge, it's really impressive that it's still, everything is flying and, and whatnot. And so some of the chains, you know, Solana, other, you know, kinds of Avalanche, et cetera, Polkadot, Near, um, all these, all these projects, we'll see how well they're doing by 2025 or 2026, right? seems like Solana keeps shipping. We'll see what happens. And then what you get is you, you might have something where like Bitcoin is your, you know, somebody's life savings or it's their, you know, the rainy day fund. And then, and that's just totally immutable. And then you gear change down. And then Ethereum is like your DAO, your corporate charter effectively, which you don't change very often, but you do want to change from time to time. It's somewhat mutable. And then you gear change down again. And maybe something like Solana is used for just blasting lots and lots of transactions on chain for like a video game or something. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's a use for that too. Right. Um, and so you might have just like gear changes on a bicycle. I kind of think that's already happening. So that's why I, 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 you know, I think it's always dumb when it's like pitted as zero sum in this way, because we're going to need to build an entire crypto economy. We are building that. Well, it's a good segue to, to the uh, layer one narrative uh, and, uh, and, and some of the themes here. I, I think, think this year, if last year was about the, about the ETH, quote unquote, this year, this year was a turn of the king. Um, and and uh, you know, the Ethereum merge was probably the brightest spot in an otherwise bleak year. Uh, for the industry, just the the technical achievement, uh, what it did for the long economics of the project, project, and and you know, I just I think it was a it was a, a significant milestone across the board. Um, uh, it was a other... non-event, which is why it was an event. Exactly. Yeah. The, how, yeah how, which is how... actually like extremely. I mean, man, extremely. Got to give hats yep. off to them the, yep. for the fact yep. that they were able to pull off something that massive without any obvious disruption. Yep. I mean. I was actually, I was concerned going into it. I was concerned. It's hard yeah. to ship. It's hard to just do a big bang switch over. You know, Dig? Remember Dig? No. Yeah, exactly. Right. Dig used to be a Reddit competitor and they were doing quite well. They were ahead of Reddit. And then they switched over to Dig V4 and they couldn't switch back. And they just basically died after that. Interesting. Right? Interesting. So <laughs> that was the risk. I mean, you know, like it's crypto, right? Like, can you imagine how many different weird edge case kinds of things? Like, it's true the beacon chain was running for a while, but it wasn't running with an ETH2 coin on there. It wasn't, you know, it was just something where if you could, you, you might have tested it more aggressively beforehand, potentially, but it seems to work. So fine. Go ahead. Can you hear Not me right now? Song by Mudvayne. Dig, D-I-G-G, -G, the website. Got it. Can you hear me right now? I know a lot of people were complaining about the audio issues, so I'm, I'm on my third microphone now. Um, let me see. Hold on. How about now? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, okay go good. ahead. Um, 
So uh, hopefully that's better for those that are watching on YouTube. Uh, I've, I've tried three microphones now, so uh, third time's a charm, maybe. This one seems um, the best one, so go ahead. Okay, okay, good. Um, so uh, massive upgrade, huge uh, opportunity, I think, ahead for the Ethereum community. Um, we, we're now starting to see a kind of bifurcation uh, of, of two camps. One is kind of the modularity camp, and the other one is the monolithic camp, if you will. So the modularity being, you know, the, the future is going to be Ethereum compatible chains, you know, EVM standard rollups, um, other data availability layers uh, that are all somehow interoperable with this kind of, you know, master chain. And then the other is, you know, are you going to be able to scale base layer chains like an Aptos or Sui or Solana um, for certain types of transactions? Uh, that are high throughput and, you know, are, are these you know, blockchains ultimately going to be you know, competitive with, uh, with, with, you know, the current market leader, Ethereum and, and all of its related um, uh, rollups and, and compatible chains where um, I think, I think you just kind of tease the answer in part one, which is, uh, you know, the, the gear example, gear up, gear down. But um, what do you think it's going to take for some of these non-Ethereum blockchains to sustain momentum in a prolonged downward uh, trending market um, when it comes to scarce developer resources, attention, you know, uh, business development wins, et cetera. Um, is there, you know, what, what have you seen? I know you've invested in some of these other projects. What have you seen work well? What stood out to you um, about their ability to scale and their ability to find a niche within the market? Um, despite the lead that Ethereum has? Yeah, so, um, it, you know, right now it seems like Solana is doing the best, you know, there, of, you know, it's probably number three or what have you in terms of traction. Um, and, you know, the thing is that I'd say over the last five years or so, crypto uh, was engaged in what I consider normie tech competition. You know, it was like a technological space. And so that's why the not I'm not I'm not critiquing it, but that's why the framing that you're using of what is the chain that competes with Ethereum, and we're thinking about it as tech products that are competing on features and and so on and so forth, right? But I think that uh, so so the short answer to your question is I don't have a very strong view on that. I'm an investor in a bunch of different chains and what have you. I do think that we'll probably see some zero knowledge chains, like I mentioned, a, a Ethereum, right? If you take Bitcoin, the two in my view, the biggest innovations on Bitcoin were A, in the direction of privacy, which is Zcash, and B, in the direction of programmability, which is Ethereum. And Ethereum has barked very, you know, the, Ethereum is a dog that did bark. It's, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in this giant kind of ecosystem over the last 10 years um, or eight years. Whereas Zcash is, I think, very important. And piece of Zcash, like, you know, become part of ZK Rollups, which is a big part of Ethereum and have been absorbed into things like Tornado Cash and what have you. But the privacy thing feels like that hasn't um, like advanced uh, in popular consciousness as much as the programmability and digital gold things. Mm -hmm. That may change. Uh, how could that change? Well, first is you might have a Zithereum, okay, where from the beginning, it's set up to be private and programmable at ground layer. And if you, it's hard to bolt privacy back onto something, you know? It's, uh, it's just something where there's so many ways to leak it and uh, what have you that if it wasn't, if a chain wasn't built for base layer pri privacy at the base layer, it may not be able to do that. So that's like one direction that one might go. And for example, the Canadian truckers earlier this year, Bitcoin was sent to them, but it was very easily tracked and what have you. And so the need for something like Zcash, which is truly zero knowledge, um, you know, became obvious or, or maybe a son of Zcash or a Ethereum of some kind. So that's kind of one direction. What, what I think is you know, maybe, maybe an open thing. The second is, you know, like just trying to compete with Ethereum on speed of transactions and so forth. And then what happens is you're often sacrificing the unseen, which is um, you're basically going to more and more of a corporate chain. And, uh, you know, you, you'll hear Ethereum people sound like Bitcoin maximalists when they talk about these other chains, right? They're not as decentralized. They're not as this, they're, you know, they're trading things off. They're just like a corporation, you know, blah, 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 right? And there's some truth to that in the sense that there's a spectrum of totally ideological and somewhat ideological and then non-ideological and corporate, right? 
And if I had, if, you know, like a thesis about what the next five-ish years of crypto, maybe 10, are going to be, they're going to be much more ideological. Mm -hmm. That's to say, like we have, it's kind of like cross-country skis, you know, if you remember like the first five years of Bitcoin were very ideological and then maybe the last 10 years of crypto have been less so. And now I think we get ideological again and not necessarily purely in a, you know, Ron Paul, you know, Fed kind of way, but in a many ideologies way in the ways that crypto enables right? Lots and lots of different tribes. You're starting to see this also with Twitter itself, like fracturing into this Mastodon and that Mastodon and Poster and Farcaster and Tribal and, and so on and so forth, right? And crypto abets that. Crypto enables that, right? And that's, that's kind of the third thing is I think enabling all that community <clears throat> ideological formation, not running away from it, not trying to be a neutral technology, but trying to be a technology that people can make their own and make it opinionated, I think is going to be important. So I'm not saying that that middle way of like the corporate, not middle, the second thing I mentioned, the, the corporate competition, I'm not saying that doesn't exist, but to just summarize, I think privacy, like the, the from scratch privacy chain, uh, or maybe it's a retrofit, but it might be hard. Corporate competition on just blasting transactions, doing corporate deals. That's one, that's another avenue. And the third is just leaning into ideology. And, and I think that's, those are three possibilities. Do you think that uh, Zcash could evolve into that network? Um, so that, I mean, there's, there's three ways to do this, right? Z there's, there's, there's Ethereum, which it's already on the roadmap, right? Um, as, as part of the scourge that Ethereum, uh, that Vitalik added to the roadmap and, and some other privacy enhancing improvements that they want to bake in. Um, it is on the developer's mind. Um, but, uh, you know, we had a conversation at, at mainnet with Zuko and, and Vitalik, uh, kind of arguing about whether you could truly have, um, uh, privacy on an L1, which you just alluded to, if you didn't have kind of base layer ingrained privacy from the get-go and like a, a shared you know, private pool of, of, of transactions at the base layer. Um, Zcash has that, but then they don't have the extensibility or the network that, that Ethereum does. So, I mean, could, could they create a, a side chain or a roll-up into the EVM? Yeah, I think, I think what, what's the um, if I recall, there, they were working on like CRC20. Like mm -hmm. Yep. Um, see if that's still there, right? They're, they were trying to make like Zcash tokens, right? Um, here, there was a there was like a tweet on this. I don't know the very latest uh, on this, but um, yeah, I mean, like basically that's that's certainly a possibility. I mean, Zcash, Zcash has tons of potential. Um, it, you know, what's interesting is there's sort of two possible, uh, not only two, there's two possible quote failure modes. And I, I certainly am not saying Zcash has failed. I, I actually think it's great. But there's at least two failure modes. And one is uh, the one we, we typically see, which is somebody is too pumpy. You know, they're out there and they're, you know, like just, just pumping the coin all the time and spam bots and so on and so forth, right? Mm. That's a more typical failure mode. And the opposite is actually when you're maybe, I hate to say this, too academic, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's something where it's like the, you know, Hillel, the sage. Yep. Um, he's like, uh, if I am only for myself, who am I? If I am not for myself, who will be for me? Right. And that's a balance, right? It's like you have a balance of standing up for yourself. I may have mis, mis you know, remembered that, but I think that's the gist of it. You have to stand up for yourself, but you can't just be so selfish. And conversely, if you won't stand up for yourself, who will stand up for you? And so you can kind of err on one side or the other. And Zcash isn't out there sponsoring stadiums or they're not doing, you know, they're just not set up to do anything like that. They are decentralized enough. They don't actually have the resources to do any of that, right? Mm -hmm. So it's been like a slower burn for them in some ways. But um, they've always been a, you know, Sergey Brin even remarked on Zcash like several years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, whatever, you and I have, all, have been appreciative of like what zero knowledge is for a long time. It just hasn't caught on yet. Um, and I don't know why, maybe there's gonna be some, like, I don't know, maybe there's a dump of everybody's financial transactions or something, and then everyone gets the message like FTX, like, oh, actually FTX showed what centralized exchanges could be. You should get your coins off exchanges, um, regardless if they're good or bad, like you should withdraw them, they allow you to withdraw them, hold them locally if you can, only buy and sell on exchanges when you need to and then withdraw, right? Um, and, uh, you know, maybe there'll be some huge financial privacy thing that makes that's kind of like that, that pushes people to like privacy coins. I don't know. We'll see.
Well, it's a good segue because I want to get into uh, NFTs, and 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 to me, I think some of the most interesting you know components of the NFT ecosystem are actually. Oh, actually, right. uh, let me argue Go against ahead. myself on that for one second. Tornado yeah. Cash obviously was a big deal, a big enough deal that the government is like holding this guy. What's holding this guy without charge? And you know, the Netherlands, like um, Alexei Pertz of you know, was, was mm-hmm. held without charge for basically developing software financial privacy tools. So that's maybe another reason why it's being held back in adoption because of these Just sort of, fear. Yeah. You know, yeah, fear. That could be it. So then, you know, maybe like find a country where you can do it and do it pseudonymously. Maybe, you know, Denmark, uh, like, a, is it Denmark? Do they, they have the pirate party there? Where was that? Was it Sweden? Um, I think it was Sweden. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sweden, right? So like Spotify came out of Sweden. Maybe there's still some pirate party DNA there, right? So maybe that's where you do it. I don't know, um, so, but could could research this. Go ahead. Um, so I, I think it's a good point. I mean, you know, it, it's dystopian, but it it is one of those. Um, it is one of the issues in crypto where it almost doesn't feel like it's worth the risk on an individual basis. Like it, everybody wants this to exist, but um, this is at the bleeding edge of things that are going to piss off the state. And well, but, the, but there's the, other reasons for it, which are, which are, mm-hmm. it's like HTTPS, right? If you have Ethereum. 100%, I think. And I think the Zcash, you know, foundation, ECC, like to your point, they've, they've been at the, at the forefront of, of some of these conversations. Uh, the privacy is normal campaign. Uh, yeah, yes. I think is, I think is brilliant. It's spot on. Um, and I think we need more of that. The question is whether, um, people like society at large and policymakers in particular will accept, um, the concept that we should have a fully private kind of you know, pool of, of transactions at a base layer versus um, what Ethereum is seeking to do, which is a transparent layer by default, and then private pools where you can mix transactions. Um, but then maybe at an institutional level, if you're trying to leverage that technology, you're able to do it because you have view keys that you're giving to regulators or um, you're, you're otherwise you know, able to show you know, selectively what your transaction history is, even if you're obfuscating it from the public. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a, a tricky. I mean, you can, uh, you can still do that, story. right? With view keys and so on, both, mm-hmm. both Ethereum, Zcash and Monero. Zcash. Both that. Maybe that's what you're just saying. Go ahead. Well, I, I am, but what I'm saying is the default is everything else is also private on, on Zcash, right? So, yeah. But, but like you know, there's things yeah. like MEV that argue mm-hmm. for that. Yep. Right. So like MEV, oh, uh, you know, that, that's the way, that's the way I think we should go. I think that's, you know, the, the question is like, who builds it, who's out there kind of, you know, taking the, um, uh, taking the, taking the risks and, and, and the bullets because right. it's, it's a somewhat thankless job to be honest. It, it is. But I also think <clears throat> that you can do it as a relay race mm-hmm. and, you know, in a relay race, it's not like one guy who runs around the whole thing. Right. You know, so there's some people who make movies on why privacy is normal and why, you know, for example, I, I, I was tweeting this, a while back, privacy over KYC. You know why? Because the government, the US government, it's a combination of the Stasi and the Keystone Cops, where they hoover up, <laughs> they hoover up all of this information on people, right? The NSA slurps it all up. And then it keeps getting hacked out the back with the OPM hack, with you know, the tech sec, there's giant, giant hacks of all this data, right? Um, and uh, so what that what that means is you have this weird thing that they're slurping it all up and then they cannot even secure it. They've got like an open garage door in the back, right? And what that does is it actually causes more harm than they think they're preventing because it gives any criminal who's got that database, oh, thank you very much. I've got an enriched list of leads of all the people I can go and, you know, home invade or whatever, right? And uh, and I think that eventually, mm-hmm. like that is a moral argument that we have to make. Right. That basically this practice of them, you know, any agency that has a hack should like not be able to collect data for perhaps indefinitely, but maybe for like 10 years or at a minimum should have to delete every citizen who opts out or something like that. Right. The thing is, there has to be some penalty for them collecting data and then, you know, forcing people See, with a company. If you don't like it, uh, you don't have to use it in the first place. Right. When the state forces you into this and then it's surveilled out the back, it's really bad. Point is making that moral case, which is actually a relatively novel one, right? Why? Because when you talk about KYC or something, yes, obviously comply with the law as it is. But people will be like, well, you know, if we didn't do this, there'd be money laundering, blah, blah. And it's like, actually, if you add it up, I bet the damage from hacks of KYC databases are significantly more, the violence that comes out of that, et cetera, that, than the, the damage from, quote, money laundering, right? 
um, especially given that money laundering seems to be done by every major bank, you know, like there's always another, you know, HSBC, whatever, there's always another fine that's announced with these things, right? Anyway, so, so point is you make the, the moral case with one group. They're not even coding. Then you mm -hmm. code, you have another group that's doing coding. I'm talking truly different groups, right? And then you have a third group that is, you know, like deploying and so on and so forth. So it's a relay race where no one component of it is something that can be attacked. It's decentralized, right? And yeah. uh, the, the, the ultimate I think that's, that's decentralization. Go ahead. Yep, exactly. It, it, it has to be decentralized by design. Otherwise, you know, people will be fearful for their freedom uh, in, in many jurisdictions. So, um, okay. So uh, one half of privacy is at the transaction level. The other is, you know, mostly at the identity level. Uh, and, and that's actually where I think some of the most interesting innovations in the NFT space are. Um, I uh, did not spend a whole lot of time on profile picture projects or uh, digital art or GameFi or anything like that in the report. I have some sections on it, but I'm, I'm not uh, super, uh, super bullish on it. I, I personally think that uh, that gaming and metaverse projects are going to be a, an absolute capital incinerator um, for, uh, for the next cycle. <laughs> one of my contrarian takes, uh, since that was one of the, the top uh, areas of funding by VCs in the last uh, year or so. Yeah, yeah, but... but but Oculus right, Quest 2 is actually, or medical, it's actually selling a fair number of units. I, you know what? You, see, uh, you know that? So putting, it's yeah, putting, units. Putting, putting the Oculus on was one of the most magical tech experiences, like doing that like little blue mesh grid yeah. right, around yourself. You know what, Bology? I haven't used it in a year. So I know, but <laughs> that's, that's, that's the problem, right? Like it's like, yes, it's so cool. And then you're like, oh, it's like that meme. Oh no. Anyway. Right? Yeah, 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 I know, but but uh, I will. So let me actually poke on you on this in a bit. I actually, I'm. Is it Meta that gets there? I don't know, but like, um, you know, they're actually. This is similar to the Filecoin thing, right? Where mm -hmm. they're actually posting like pretty good numbers here, and it's like growing. And um, uh, you know what I think actually you get what they're working on is they're, they're fully aware of the thing you just mentioned, right? Which is it's a commitment to go put on the VR headset, right? So what they're what Meta and uh, you know Hololens guys at, at Microsoft and Apple's group and Google's group, what they're all working on are AR glasses, where they've got the form factor of glasses, and like Snapchat spectacles, you can like record with them. Like Oculus, you can do VR or you can do like pass through AR. Uh, like Google Glass, you can get like you know, overlays like Apple AR kit, it's like programmable. So it combines aspects of these. So there's a bunch of these different projects I've seen, including startups. And that to me is the most predictable invention of the 2020s. That like, so, it, we, so let me, let me, let me say two things. One, I don't disagree with you, but two, that doesn't necessarily change my thesis on, on kind of metaverse plays with, within crypto, right? So like, crypto sure, sure, sure. Because uh, uh, you're basically right. betting on two upstream Dependencies. One, yeah, but that you hardware want the issue, to come out first. That, the that obvious that hardware, be out there first. Yeah. that hardware issue gets solved, and there's a tipping point, right? And it's not clear what that date is. And then two, when it is solved, those platform creators that spent tens of billions of dollars investing in this new frontier are suddenly going to open it up to crypto, like they did not do, and they've proven reluctant to do with the Android and iOS, you know, mobile stores. So, you know, I just, I find that to be, you know, a, a tenuous uh, kind of one, two punch that you're, you're hanging your hat on that like, Oh, crypto ah. games are going to be huge. So, well, okay. So I'm, I mean, I'm not like, a, I'm not necessarily a huge advocate of crypto games mm -hmm. per se, right. There are people who mm -hmm. are, what I'm an advocate of, I do think actually AR glasses, I think of AR glasses as being to this decade, what, I don't know, the iPhone was to 2001 or 2002. People talked about like the convergence device and then it happened, right? It just wasn't a TV. It was a phone, right? Yep. And um, so, so I'm bullish on that, like the mixed reality convergence device glasses thing. I think that will happen. That'll get our hands back because you don't have to be like, you know, looking at the phone all the time. You can be like hands up. It's actually a really big deal. You can run and, you know, outside you can maybe it's got like a headphone thing as well, right? So, uh, so that that's one part. Their part is, I actually do think that uh, past performance is not necessarily indicative. I mean, in the um, in the early two thousands, to say that Microsoft would flip on Linux, and not simply flip and say, okay, grudgingly, it's all right, 
but literally run giant server farms of you know Linux computers, which it does do, right? And acquire GitHub of all things, <laughs> right? Even in the late 2000s, that wasn't obvious. And then what eventually happens is the pressure becomes too much and the holdouts are just isolated. And I think that's going to happen with crypto as well. I don't know when that is, whether it's 2025 or 2028, but like already, if you want to send a wire across borders, I mean, all you have to do, the case for crypto is to walk into a bank and try to do something. That's yep. a case for crypto, right? Like whether it's a wire or whether it's setting up a bank account in the first place, which takes days, or, you know, you have some stupid fraud check on a credit card and a thing is frozen or whatever, like <clears throat> all of that type of stuff. That alone is just, if you ever get depressed on crypto, that's the advertisement. So point being, by 2028 or something, you have a generation of tech execs that has grown up with this stuff. I mean, it's 2025, 2028. That's not that far off. I mean, that's the thing is, we, we add plus one years. So this is one thing I had to remember. Every year, there's another group of 21-year-olds coming in that have about as much context as you and I did when we got into, you know, whatever space. Like, all of that prologue, all of the PC wars of the 80s and the internet wars of the 90s was basically just stuff we kind of knew about but not like deeply. And then we kind of came in fresh. It's like teleported yeah. into the battlefield, right? So those mm -hmm. new kids coming in and the tech executives being around crypto, I'm not sure the VR app stores or the, the augmented reality app stores will fight crypto in the same way. They will potentially lean into it because they can tax the whole market, you know, if they've got a coin on it, right? Yep. Um, or, or they can, you know, address the entire global market if they use an existing global coin, right? So anyway, so basically that's why I'm without buying fully into crypto games, I'm probably more bullish on that in the long run, maybe than you are. That's my counter thesis. Go ahead. Uh, in, in the long run, I am bullish. I don't, I don't want to, okay. uh, I, I don't want to say that. Count I'm out not... the long run. The long run is long. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but exactly. I, 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 again, going back to one of my first comments, early equals wrong. And that still feels like something that's going to take a while to season and, and, and people might be getting ahead of themselves. Um, and um, and startup funding uh, cycles are, are, are going to be a little bit longer at this point, right? So if you look at a lot of the money that was raised in, in crypto gaming uh, in 2022, it was seed and series A. Well, those seed and series A's are going to have to last a hell of a lot longer than they did in 2017 through 2020 and, and, and last year uh, because of the, the state of the funding market. We actually have, um, Dougie, I don't know if you want to pull it up, but the um, we acquired Dove Metrics. Um, a, uh, a venture capital data tracker uh, within the industry uh, earlier this year. And, um, and we track the pace uh, uh, between the first half and the second half and, and the fall off is pretty steep. Dougie, this is going to be uh, section, you know, chapter one, uh, somewhere in the, the seven to eight range in terms of the section, but that graphic on the, the VC trends. Um, we saw a, uh, about 30 billion in venture capital raised last year. We saw 29 billion raised in the first half of this year, right? So private markets not quite catching up, and um, and back half of this year 6.6. .6. So we're down 70 percent. I think next year will likely be you know 10 to 12 billion in total funding for the year uh, after uh, a first half of this year where where it was closer to 30 billion. So that that funding um, cycle is is going to slow down pretty precipitously, and um, and just given the velocity of um, Web3 gaming uh, franchises or, or startups that were funded. Um, I know some of those were big rounds. They're going to have to be because I think those dollars are going to have to last. But anyway. I mean, you know, I, 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 I somewhat agree with you. I also think that basically <clears throat> the new model is can you make money? <laughs> uh, and what, it's just old is new. Yep. Old is new. And um, I do wonder whether or not you could do things where you have crypto communities that just fund the products that they want to see exist, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is something you can do in the 2020s that you really couldn't do in the 2010s in the same way, which is it's certainly not in the 2000s. The ubiquity mm -hmm. of social means you can build a community before the company. That's a new thing, right? You can yep. literally have enough people, enough scale to support a SaaS business or a crypto business or whatever business if you can build the right community first. And then you can kind of tune the product to be something for them and then they can have an equity stake in it as well, right? Yep. And so I feel like that might be an alternate model rather than VC to sustain a business is not, hey, oh, let me get the next round. And so obviously I know that business, I know that quite well, it's, it's appropriate at times, but perhaps community funding is now more feasible and maybe crypto can, can help with that. 
All right, so we took a detour into, into game five, which is longer than I thought it was going to, but it's good because uh, you know I don't want to just be uh, uh, seem like I'm I'm shilling and 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 unabashedly bullish on every single sector of crypto. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, that I don't. But um, um, but what I did want to talk about, um, and I know you have a lot of thoughts on decentralized, you know, the other side of privacy. So decentralized identity, um, decentralized, you know, social media and media of all kinds. Um, mm -hmm. and uh, an online you know, reputation within crypto, right? These these seem like some of the the real interesting building blocks um, of the crypto network that we haven't seen uh, really hit their full stride or you know, full potential just yet. Um, and they're going to open up, you know, so many different. Uh, use cases, so many different applications. If if we can actually, you know, make a, a, a significant improvement in uh, crypto reputation systems, crypto identity systems, I, I think in this cycle, what's different this time uh, versus last uh, couple of cycles is I actually think that we're building on a more solid foundation this time around uh, with things like uh, Lens and ENS and you know the the other you know early decentralized social and 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 identity primitives. Um, so you know what I would love to hear, you know, Balaji, you spent a lot of time uh, thinking about this, and, and I think this is one of your core themes as well that you focused on. How do you yep. think about the future of media, and and you know, do you think about media uh, and identity as kind of intrinsically you know linked in some respects because your your identity is your content? Right and and kind of what you put out in the world and in, in, in terms of the virtual world, what what do you think about the um, uh, the the stack here? Well, so I actually had this tweet the other day, which is something like uh, the end of corporate media is corporate journalism is now in sight. It's mm -hmm. all going to be citizen journalism from here. Why? Because you have AI like ChatGPT that can actually write articles quicker, and you have. Um, you know, Twitter that can now do the decentralized citizen reporting of original, you know, content. And then you have crypto to check the facts. And like decentralized media is kind of, you know, I think it's going to combine all these pieces. All these pieces are now like in a primeval broth that are, you know, kind of bubbling and, and coming together. But like, yeah, Lens, Farcaster, Mirror, uh, this stuff is now, you can use it on a daily basis. It works, right? Like you can, people use Farcaster, it works. And it doesn't necessarily need to be having every single piece decentralized, but does it have NFTs in there to filter communities? It does. Does it have like ENS integration? It does. It's like crypto aware social networks. You don't have to jump just like, uh, you know, Netflix was an internet company, but it didn't jump directly to streaming video. It just built a catalog online. It actually only did streaming by like 2013 or thereabouts, right? Like that. And House of Cards was a big deal for it, right? Again, relatively recently, only 10 years ago, it was like, it's probably longer as a mail order company, I think 99 to 2013, than it has been as a streaming company, if I, if I remember it correctly, but it's, it's about the same, okay? And so these crypto aware social networks don't have to be fully decentralized to be impactful, that's A. B is, uh, you know, it's now like billions of people have saw Trump get deplatformed, they've seen people get deplatformed. These things are no longer theoretical. Deplatforming, unbanking, that's what like a huge part of the political debate is about. Not like, oh, you're so paranoid, this will never happen. But it happened. It happened to many people. It keeps happening. It's clearly an issue. It's now happening to their side. Therefore, digital property rights will be an issue. And not your keys, not your coins applies to Bitcoin, but not your keys, not your account applies to social. You know, all the work that you put into that thing, unless those keys are local, um, you know, one way of thinking about it, here's you, right? And then here is Twitter. And then here's all of your followers. Twitter intermediates. And exporting your data, that actually doesn't get to the core of it. Yeah, I can get all my messages out, whatever, all my tweets, fine. That's all public stuff. Who cares? But can I contact all of these people without Twitter's consent? No. Twitter mediates that, right? Mm -hmm. Twitter owns the social graph. If you can remove that and one ENS can <clears throat> talk to a thousand other ENSs without that social media corporation in the middle, that is decentralization, right? That's decentralized media. It's like a, literally like a fan topology. Now, of course, social media was a huge improvement over what came before because in the 90s, you know, or the transition from the 90s to the 2000s, in the 2000s, you're like, wait a second, this website is giving me a microphone and a camera and it lets me stream to everybody and it's free and it'll do discovery for me. And <clears> like, it, it was an insane, insane, you know, advantage over the 80s or the 90s when nobody could broadcast anything. 
But now that's become a commodity. And so the next step is actually have digital property rights. So I'm very bullish on decentralized media for digital property rights because it puts the world on a fair playing field because it doesn't have to be fully decentralized because it can just be crypto aware. And because you could probably figure out a lot of ways to make money on it that you couldn't on social media. And if you can make an influencer even a few hundred dollars a year, they're probably going to like your platform more than one that they can't, right? So for all those reasons, I think decentralized media is going to be big. Um, so I, I couldn't agree more. I, you know, one, one of the things that popped up when, um, when you're talking about the, uh, the, the ENS example and the messaging example, part of the value in current social networks is that they're rules-based and they're consistent, right? So you figure out the rules for Facebook, you figure out the rules for Twitter, you figure out the, you know, like basically how the product, um, you know, what you can and can't do in the product. And then everybody operates within those same constraints. Um, if you're able to customize that, it also means that, you know, if you can send messages to a thousand people in your social graph, that creates like a new form of spam, right? So th this is like the, the moderation versus curation versus censorship lines are always very blurry with web two companies. How do you think that ultimately gets solved for in web three? Is everybody gonna have to meticulously comb like what their permissions are on a per user or per I think social graph basis? Or... I, think it's a, I think it's a million hubs and a billion nodes. Okay. So meaning there's a bunch of, um, I don't know how many, but there's a lot of admins that run hubs. Okay. I don't know, one out of a thousand, one out of 10,000. It's relatively unusual to run a hub, but there's so many people on an app. It's like the, the kind of person who can use GitHub is the kind of person who can run a social media hub. Yep. Okay. But that's tens of millions of people worldwide. Okay. So you'll have a lot of people who are running these social media hubs. They'll be effectively like the local mayor or, you know, the, if they rise large enough, they're like... <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the governor or even the president, depending on how big their hub gets. And then they just set the policies based on their discretion. And, uh, but also based on the stated ideology of that node. This is kind of how Mastodon's already going. This is how, I mean, it's a transition from social network to single tribe network. You go from that, I, the concept of a single tribe network means a group of people who share values, right? Whereas a social network has a bunch of people who don't share values. You've got the Supreme Leader of Iran, along with the Chinese Communist Party members, alongside, you know, like all kinds of different political ideologies that do not agree with other people on very basic things, you know, like, and so they're, that's just a fight club. You know, they don't share anything in common. And I think that era is ending. And now we have the era of lots and lots of individual communities, basically digital villages that you can join. And crypto is central to all of that because it gives you the keys to the kingdom. Um, it allows you to leave. If you build up some capital there, you can leave and you can go to somebody else's village if they'll take you, right? That's mm -hmm. what I think we're, we're going to see digitally and then eventually physically. Um, so uh, one other area uh, that, that I think this gets interesting, you brought up chat GBT. Um, I saw, um, I can't remember who had the, uh, who had the line? Maybe it was Aaron, right? Um, he's usually uh, good for for very futuristic tweets. He's 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 been on. Uh, he's one of the one of the most underrated followers, I think, on on Twitter. Aaron uh, from uh, uh, Tribute Labs now. So early on uh, Bitcoin, early on Ethereum, early on DAOs, uh, and and so on. But um, uh, I think he may have been the one that said this. So, uh, I saw a tweet the other day though that um, we are entering a period of time where uh, AI is getting so good, right? Deep fakes are getting so good that like without crypto, we are going to have a oh, yeah. time separating I, I, like what's real versus yeah. like, well, like our, 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 we're, we're going to you know, basically have like mental breaks, I think, because we're not going to oh, like, we're not going to be able to like parse what's, what's real and human versus, you know, what's, what's been generated online. Yeah. So I've been talking about this for a long time. Uh, I agree, <laughs> but basically you know, the only trustworthy thing in an era of deep fakes and fake news and so on and so forth is going to be cryptographically signed data. And it's only trustworthy insofar as you don't actually know that it wasn't monkeyed with because they could monkey with it. And when they upload it, what you do know is that that person uh, at that time put that digital object with this hash on chain, right? So you can get the who via digital signature and the when via the timestamp and the what via the hash. And then it actually reduces to how trustworthy is that person. So you get web three of trust, 
you know, web of trust, it becomes web three of trust. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, actually, that's what all of the language around neutral media or objective journalism really it reduces to your trust in that report. And reporters, corporate journalists have given very good reason for people to not trust them. Do you see that study where they actually admitted that like um, trust in media is like down to like 11% or something? Do you see that? <laughs> Uh, I didn't see the specific place. study, but I, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised. Here we go. Ready? Here we go. <clears throat> um, it's pretty amazing stuff. Uh, trust in news collapses to historic low. So, I mean, essentially what happened was um, they spent down their trust for clicks. Yep. And so, of course, no one trusts them. I mean, that's a total, total, total collapse. Look at that like down to like 11% from 45% when we were growing up. Yeah, hit that X. Yeah, zoom in there. So 1995, Oof. look at that, right? It's finished, they're finished. And, <laughs> and so like, wow. so what, will you, what do you have a great deal of confidence in? Cryptography, mathematics, right? Essentially a counter elite is rising. That is the global, you know, like, people who are in crypto and tech and what have you. And um, as opposed to the elite class that is saying that it's just, you know, some media corporation is defining what's truth. And uh, so, you know, decentralized cryptographic truth over, you know, like basically centralized corporate truth. That's, that's obviously the future in my view. And, and the, the reason we can see that is we can see that um, these threads with people doing on-chain analysis, you know, you have, the early on-chain journalists, right? The on-chain citizen journalists like Willy Woo um, or Zach XBT or, you know, some of the threads mm -hmm. that were tracking like flow of funds for FTX and so on. Like right now, it's only financial transactions that are, that are on-chain. But you put these two things we were just talking about. Once you have on-chain social, so it's not just financial transactions, but social media stuff that's on-chain. And you have major events that are happening there. You can start to actually see what really happened. Okay, this person posted this at this time, that I know, and that's like a basic fact. And now I can start reasoning about the rest from that. You know, you can actually do logical inference on the things you can prove with your computer, which is running computation on those things, right? And that allows people to actually have something solid that they can hang on to in this hall of mirrors that is, you know, the AI, you know, deep fake, fake news internet, right? Apology, um, do, you, do you worry about prediction markets or curation markets um, ultimately getting corrupted in terms of like, what is truth? Uh, because yeah. there are online mobs. So, so think back to like, you know, COVID hysteria. Um, I'm not, I'm, I, you know, Balaji and I took COVID for, for those new to the programming, Balaji and I took COVID or uh, serious earlier than just about anybody on the planet. So, um, so I'm not minimizing the disease itself, but the COVID hysteria is right. you know, kind of the, the, the resulting policies after the fact and some of the banning of discussion around, you know, what the quote unquote science was, you know, that feels like something that, you know, in a large prediction market or a large curation market might like the truth might lose in a proof of stake system, right? The oracles could get manipulated just by like almost like brute social force. Are there ways to prevent against that, right? Are, are, are there ways to make sure that, you know, these crypto systems actually spit out the right answers um, and that the incentives work and bend towards truth instead of just what the strongest majority says is the truth? Well, so uh, I actually have this whole talk on the ledger of record where I talk about some of that. I'll talk about some of that on the lecture and podcast, but short answer is... <clears throat> Anything that you can't reproduce independently yourself, you can't know for sure is true. Mm -hmm. And everything else is simply like a proxy for that. For yep. example, if someone says water boils at this temperature, you can go and run that experiment for yourself relatively cheaply, you know, or I don't know what the Mentos and Pepsi thing. Okay. You can go try that for yourself. Try it at home, kids, you know, um, and less trivially, lots of, lots of scientific discoveries if they're written up the right way and you can replicate them, then you can replicate them. If you can't replicate them, then you have some degree of trust. And uh, what you're getting at is okay. markets are better than polls because there's scarcity involved, but they're still more vulnerable to social manipulation than a scientific experiment. 
right? Mm -hmm. And that's true. And that's why I don't actually think of prediction markets as predicting the future. I think they're useful as verification markets for verifying the past. That is to say, like in a horse race, two parties, one of them may not have any particular advantage on predicting which horse is going to win, actually. But there is a significant advantage for the entire market in giving a very accurate determination of who did win. And that's actually where I see the value of things like Metaculus or other things is not so much the predicting, but the sort of verified historical record of facts that are contentious enough to have bets on on either side. And then there's financial incentive to at least try to get those right. And then people will try to back off if they're mm -hmm. wrong or whatever. Right. So prediction market, that's a twist on prediction markets. It's not the future that you care about. You assume that people have no signal on the future. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Right. The reason I'm, uh, you know, the reason I say that I don't think they have much signal is it's rare that a prediction market has so much depth and liquidity that you could make as much money in it as you could on leveraging something outside the prediction market if you truly had confidence in those future events, right? Like, um, but for verifying the past on a contentious thing, that's pretty good. So that's that's why I, you know, I talk about some of the crypto history stuff in the book, but TLDR mm -hmm. is, unless you can actually go and independently reproduce a scientific experiment, you're gonna have to have some degree of trust. And then you might be able to reduce how much trust you have where it's like, I trust these four people's personal reports based on the all the other information I've got from them. And that's what I'm basing this on. So at least you can make it mm -hmm. computable because you can see this person said this at this time and I trust them, therefore I trust this. Makes sense. Um, Balaji, I could probably chat with you for another six and a half hours, uh, but I'm not Lex Friedman. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, you can no, call no it, one. it's good. Um, so, uh, and what time is it there for you locally? Uh, undisclosed location. It's, undisclosed it's, it's, location. it's broad daylight back okay. here. Okay, got it. I, I won't, I won't, uh, I will just say that Balaji Srinivasan works hard. Uh, and, uh, and I certainly try to leave it all in the field this year as well with, uh, with, uh, the 170 pages, uh, written this month. So, um, it was wonderful. By the way, you didn't mention the highlight of the year, which is the network state. Oh. <laughs> no, I did. No. I, I linked, I linked to it in the, oh, in the report. Okay. Yeah. Great, great. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm obviously I'm kidding, but I do think it actually, is toward, it is towards the end. Uh, oh, in this conversation. Well, I was going to end. I wasn't going to cut, cut off the conversation yet. I was going to say it's fine. It it's getting fine. Late. I'm, I'm joking. It is getting but, late. We're getting, we're getting towards the end. Um, yes, yes, yes. and, um, we, we, we touched a little bit on DeFi. We could have gone a lot deeper. We, we touched a little bit on decentralized hardware, touched a little bit on DAOs. Um, let's, I wanted to wrap with the network state, right? Like what, what oh, is sure. next okay. for you? What is next for, um, the project and, and, and what are you most excited for going into the new year? Well, you know, um, as Mark's once said, mm -hmm. I think, uh, the man, I'm paraphrasing here, but something like, um, man of theory have theorized and, you know, that's great, but the point is to change the world, you know, not simply to yep. write about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so th that's really the next step. I mean, I'm writing V2. I'm, I'm like getting like the really what I consider like the final version of the book out, which we can mm -hmm. translate into lots of languages and hopefully make into a video and, and so on and so forth. So actually, you know, it's funny. The network state has gone viral in places you'd never expect. Do you know that there's a, there's a guy who made a, a video on the network state in Japanese that has more than a billion million views in the YouTube. Wow. Wow. Yeah, here. Let me show you this one. Um, <clears throat> is, it's Nakoman. Uh, oh, this is Nakoman show. Uh, let me find this. Give me one second. <clears throat> well, we find that. Uh, remind everybody, uh, you can go to masari.io. Go to the homepage and download the report. Uh, sign up for Pro or Enterprise. If you're an enterprise, uh, don't miss out. We got the uh, day-to-day research that comes out that is even better uh, than the annual report that we dropped today. So um, if you need something uh, to recap the year and look ahead for the holidays, uh, you will have a nice, cozy treatise uh, to read uh, over the course of the next week or so uh, to get you primed and, and ready for the next year. So uh, try to keep it light, keep it fun. I'm already getting yelled at from a couple of different communities on Twitter. So All right. that's how you know it's good. There we go. All right, here we go. I found it. Um, put this, you can put this up. <clears throat> All right. Dougie, can you project that? that? Can we share the audio too? I don't know. Well, it's sure in Japanese, you said, right? So 
it's in Japanese with so subtitles, but it's like, like they actually did some pretty cool like animation type things. And so, I mean, there's Catalonians who are into the network state. There's you know, South Americans, there's Indians. There's actually, you can just look at network state and quotes on Twitter. Mm -hmm. There's somebody posting about it all the time. So it's actually pretty cool. And, um, oh, wow. Okay, yes, here we go. So we just go forward a little bit. Uh, like the next. No, uh, <laughs> actually back like, back like uh, 15 seconds, they've got like an animation thing. It was like, yeah, he, he basically, drinking. okay. All right, uh... now some YouTube ads or something. All right, fine. Point is, uh, watch this video if you want. It's just got some like cool animations and stuff. And he's got like this book opening thing. You know, towards the beginning, it's just like I'll uh, go forward a little bit more, a little bit further. There we go. Um, yeah, just hit play. You can just watch in the background or whatever. Yeah. You'll see. Um, point is that uh, it's a million views, zero yeah. zero marketing or anything like that. It's like a popular show, right? And uh, there's like a broad and universal appeal of this. And I feel like, you know, how big were NFTs in 2017? How big were, was DeFi? Or it wasn't even called, it was, we arguably people called them dApps, you know? And um, I think that, I think this could be pretty big over the next few years. Let's see, let's see what happens. Um, and I'm going to work on it. And obviously we'll, we'll, we'll see, but I think it pulls a few pieces together. So well, I generally, uh, generally, generally don't bet against Shibology. What is your? Uh, I guess we'll we'll wrap up with a lightning round. What's your uh, what's your top contrarian take of the new year? Top contrarian take of the new year is <clears throat> maybe there won't actually. Well, I think we have a fighting chance of preventing bad crypto regs because I'm seeing actually good things happening at the state level. Yes, if we can fight at the federal level and block at the federal level. Subnational and international is quite promising. So subnational is Tennessee and Colorado and Wyoming and Miami and New York City and so on. And international is El Salvador and Switzerland and Dubai and what have you, right? Yep. So that's the strategy is defense at the federal level and um, I think you know lobby for good things, lobby in the abstract sense, not the specific you know, concrete places. Let's say advocate for good things locally and globally. And then assume nothing good will happen at the federal level, but maybe you can block it. So that's my contrarian thing is we might be able to actually get a decent result. And the other way to get a decent result is to keep building things that are actually useful and uh, and and net yes. helpful to the average citizen and voter. The, the, um, these, so. these two things interact though, because if you've got a legal place, if you've got a few places in the world where something is legal, I mean, that's the thing by the way, and this is important, I mean, of the people of Chinese descent in the 20th century, only a small percentage of them lived in free states, unfortunately. They lived in, I mean, still, but like only a small percentage lived in capitalistic states. It was Taiwan and it was Hong Kong and it was Singapore. But their example helped reform mainland China. So, so long as there are a few places where crypto is free and legal and unencumbered, the example of those places will hopefully allow other places to, uh, to see that it's worth doing. Okay. Apology. Epic as always. I hope people enjoyed this. Uh, we are going to wrap here and I'm going to wrap for the year because I have to go wrap presents. Um, All right. But uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to doing this again in one year's time, Bology. In the meantime, yep. lots to build, uh, lots for, for us at Masari. Look forward to the Network State V2. And for everyone in the chat, go check out the reports, read it, absorb it, build something cool. And uh, we will see you in the new year. Keep on grinding. Thank you.